Awesome. Hello. Thank you for joining us uh, for our talk on planning and estimating Drupal migrations. My name is Michael Myers. I'm a longtime member of the Drupal community, and I've been part of uh, many large-scale migrations. I'm joined today by Mauricio Donarte, who's a senior engineer at Tag1. He's a recognized expert in migrations who's written a lot of articles and given a lot of talks on the topic. For those of you who aren't familiar with Tag1, we work with many large uh, organizations on large-scale mission-critical projects. Uh, we work with a lot of technologies, but we're best known for being the number two all-time contributor to Drupal. So uh, 20 years ago, we introduced the taxonomy system. Around Drupal 7, we introduced the automated quality assurance and testing system to become the bedrock of enterprise adoption. We, uh, our team members created the Migrate API, which we're going to be talking about later. Uh, I want to introduce you to our latest innovation, which is called Gander. Gander is an automated performance testing framework for front end and back end. We built it with the Google Chrome team with support from the Drupal framework managers. Uh, earlier this year, uh, it officially became part of Drupal Core. So Drupal Core now has a official performance testing framework and is helping to find and solve performance issues with the platform. We've also made it really easy for you to get up and running with Gander on your own websites. There's documentation, quick start guides, DDEV plugins, uh, faster sites get, uh, more page views, more time on site, drive more revenue if you do commerce. Uh, so a small investment in getting up and running with Gander will ensure the success of your Drupal site. Yanez is giving a talk about it tomorrow, uh, at part of the core initiatives and uh, this talk here. Uh, so I want to point out that a lot of what we're going to talk about applies uh, regardless of what platform or framework you're coming from to Drupal. So if you're coming from Sitecore or any other platform to Drupal, or you're coming from Drupal 7 to the latest version of Drupal, much of what we talk about will hopefully apply. First up, we're going to talk about why there is no easy way to do your planning. Uh, then we're going to talk about you know, how scope considerations are going to be a big factor in that. Mauricio is going to give you an anatomy of a Drupal website, which is really critical to understanding how Drupal works and how you're going to plan things, along with a site audit, and he's going to provide you with a template that you can use uh, on your own to go through and, and plan your process, and you'll see all the different options and how things start to get complicated pretty fast. Uh, data migration is one of the most critical aspects of a platform migration, so we'll talk a fair amount about that. Uh, but the challenge is you could write books on every one of these topics. There's only so much we can cover. We're going to try and highlight specific things, but I want to provide you with some resources that you can look and get more information. Uh, Mauricio wrote uh, 31 articles a little while back that gives you a really good understanding of the migration process. We also have a new data migration how-to guide that we've started publishing on tag1.com that uh, Mauricio has started writing, and it walks you through step-by-step step on how to do a data migration. It's not just geared towards technical people, though. If you are a business stakeholder, you'll learn a lot from this critical aspect. Uh, and lastly, as part of our Tag1 team talks, we've done a large number of talks specifically on migration, From the creators of Migrate, engineers have been part of lots of migrations that will give you really deep insight into a lot of these topics. So um, why do you need a framework? Why isn't there an easy way to answer this question? As an agency, uh, people reach out to us all the time and they say, hey, how much is migration going to cost me and how long is it going to take me? And they want to know that answer in the first call, maybe the second call. <laughs> and it's really challenging to do that, right? Um, as an agency, unlike end users of Drupal, we do a lot of projects. And so we can try and triangulate. We can say, oh, we've done these different projects, and you're kind of in here. Um, but the reality is, is that even a project that seems similar on the surface can be very different once you start digging under the hood. If you think about data, how clean is your data? Is it structured or not? How much you know, do you need to pull together or pull apart to get it to where you need it to go? Um, what about your organizational constraints? Who's doing this migration? Are your developers well-versed in Drupal 10? I don't know. Um, what about your timeline? Is there some sort of deadline that you need to meet? And all of these factors and stuff Mauricio is going to talk about later start adding up. And all these different permutations and all of a sudden a project that seemed like it was very similar to something else you did is very different. So I want to talk about two approach and scope considerations that are going to have a big factor. Uh, the first up is your strategy. So on one end of the spectrum, you have the concept of a lift and shift, where you try and keep as much as possible the same. And on the other end of the strategy, you have a uh, greenfield you know, development you know, where you're going to build from the ground up. So lift and shifts at a high level, um, I want to point out that there's no way to be on the extreme end of the spectrum in a platform migration. Right? There's going to be aspects that are going to change. Um, 
if you want to keep your design, you still have to re-implement your front end because you know Drupal 10 works in a different way than 7 or other platforms, so you still have a fair amount of work to do on that front. And at the same time, why would you copy over your technical debt? Why would you try and replicate bugs? And you know, so you're, you're going to make decisions on what to change, and you're going to find yourself falling somewhere on the spectrum. It's unlikely you're going to be on uh, either extreme or end. Uh, lifts and shifts can be great because you can stay really focused, and uh, that can help reduce your execution risk. And platform migrations can get pretty hairy and challenging, so that's a good idea. You might have organizational strengths uh, constraints along the lines of what I mentioned earlier. I mean, if you think about the changes you need to make in a greenfield development, well, that requires a lot of organizational decision making. And organizations tend not to be good at that kind of thing, right? What is our design you know, process? Do you like the new design? Everybody needs to get feedback on the design. Oh, yeah, I, I know, the projector is in and out. Sorry, guys, technical difficulties. Uh, I'll try and be entertaining enough that <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, th there are a lot of, you know, business challenges that we're going to get into if you try and do greenfield development. You know, if you didn't have those business challenges, it might not actually be too different to execute on a lift and shift versus a greenfield project. But that's just not the case when you factor all the considerations. Uh, sometimes you can't make changes. You might have, um, you know, regulatory requirements. And if something changes, you might have to go through a really in-depth process that you wouldn't have to do otherwise uh, as an organization. You want to avoid that. Um, we worked with an organization recently that had a gorgeous design, and there was no point in changing it. And so we kept that design and um, just re-implemented the front end. So um, another thing is that, you know, it likely will get you live and at least done with your project faster than a greenfield development, but not necessarily, again, because there are variables that are at play, and it may cost less Again, depending upon all these different variables in your approach and, and how you execute. So on the other end of the spectrum, the greenfield development and building from the ground up, you have this exciting opportunity to rethink your website. Hang on, so I'm going to try and unplug and replug the projector here. No, the projector has died. Um, sorry about that. Oh, we're back. <laughs> um, so yeah, greenfield development can be awesome. You can rethink everything. I'm sure your stakeholders, internal or external, have been sitting there saying, gosh, I really wish you had this feature. Well, now's an opportunity to do that and drive adoption of your system. At the same time, you might want to remove things, right? Things, uh, not just technical debt, but features and functionality that no one's using or not using enough or that really are you know, difficult to maintain. Um, and as part of this, it gives you an opportunity to do really interesting things. Drupal 10, you know, Dries talked earlier this morning in the keynote, there's Layout Builder, right? You can empower your technical stakeholders to do a tremendous amount to, you know, update and manage your website without having to deal with your technical resources, freeing up both groups to do more, driving innovation in your company. Everything's amazing. It drives a lot of value. It also attracts talent. Right? If you're going out there and you're trying to find Drupal developers, do they want to work on the latest and greatest, or do they want to work on a re-architecture of an older platform? You're going to be much more likely to attract people if you're doing exciting things. It's hard to say whether or not it's going to uh, cost as much or take as long as you think, because it depends how much you're removing, you know, what are you adding? You know? So again, it's really hard to answer this question up front, but uh, generally it, it, you know, it does cost more. The thing is, with all of that innovation that you're driving, with all of that, you know, you're empowering your business users to do things, your attraction of talent, maybe that offsets the cost. So if the upfront financial cost is something that you can afford, the value that you might be able to drive may be significantly more. So the next step is the transition process. On one end of the spectrum, you have the idea of a hard cutoff. This is pretty straightforward. You run your old site, you put your new site live, you take your old site offline. It's that simple. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a phase migration. And this is where you run your old site and your new site integrated in some fashion you know, for some period of time. And we'll talk about different examples to put that into context. Neither of these are bad. You know, if I spend a little bit more time on the phase, you know, it really comes down to what fits for your group and your needs. So the hard cutoff, it's the same thing as a lift and shift. It's going to reduce your complexity, making it easier for you to execute. Um, you will very likely complete your entire project faster, though you may not get live faster. Um, it will likely be less expensive because you're not having to manage different teams and different systems simultaneously. Um, the cons, 
Um, depending upon you know, how much time you have, you may have an issue training your users on your new system. And if you launch a new system and your users don't know how to use it, their experience is going to be terrible. And it doesn't matter how great your technology is, there's going to be a really bad sentiment internally about the success of this initiative that you need to crawl back from. And so it could also have business impact. Uh, and, and this is a little counterintuitive because there is reduced risk on one hand, but on the other hand, you're taking your site offline. So you know, there might be an example where you check your list, you check it twice, you put the new site live, you take it offline, and oh my, it turns out that that API that someone thought was deprecated is not. <laughs> and it's mission critical and, and something goes down and now what do you do? Do you roll back? Do you, you know, like, how do you handle that situation? And so there's potentially more risk in doing that. Um, I'm gonna rush through these a little bit because I wanna talk more about examples, but a lot of times people do phase migrations because it is the only way to solve a business need. They have to do it. Um, it potentially enables you to launch a lot quicker because you might be only doing a small component and taking it live than you are rebuilding your entire application and getting it live in you know, a specific cutoff. Um, you might be able to address that learning curve with users by having that system live in the background or by giving yourself more time to train these users over time as, a two, as two systems exist. Um, you might have cash flow issues, right? You may not be able to pay for this upfront, and so you might be able to spend money over time, even if it's more money, to achieve a greater goal. Um, it is much more complex in a lot of cases to manage these different systems. You have your old system live in the back end, which might you know, require different teams and skill sets and technologies that you have to run for some period of time. And these things tend to add up to it being a more costly approach. But again, perhaps the value that it generates or the need of doing it offsets it. So the best way to give this is through examples. These are all real world projects. We work with one of the largest hospital groups in the nation. And their problem was uh, they had an old CMS that was going end of life. And that date was hard and they could not get off their platform to any platform in the time frame that they had. So a hard cutoff wasn't an option. At the same time, they had a tremendous amount of content and you know, a picture of a hospital with lots of different groups and departments, legal requirements for approving content. They couldn't possibly get through that process in a reasonable period of time. And so what we did here is we built a proxy server. And the way this worked is we took the old site offline, we put it securely in the background that only the proxy server could talk to. The proxy server went and grabbed every page from that system. It ripped the content out of that page, just what it needed, and injected it into a Drupal design that looked exactly like the new site. So users would go to the new site, the new site would say, hey, has someone entered you know, a new site, a new page natively in my system that I can return to the user? Great. If not, get it from the proxy server. And that whole process is cached, so it happens instantaneously as if it's one site. A similar solution for a global manufacturing company, uh, platforms are very common in the Drupal community, especially with large organizations, educations, enterprises, where you're running a large number of Drupal sites. They had a large number of countries in different languages, owned by different stakeholders, some with a great deal of autonomy, and imagine you know, migrating those over. It's just not a practical option. So they did it in batches and country by country, and just did URL redirects, um, where, you know, oh, I need to go to the Taiwanese site, oh, that's the new system, okay, you go over here. You're going to the French site, that's the old system still, you're going over here. Pretty straightforward. A news media site, um, so they had a ridiculously large number of contributors internally, they had third-party contributors, they had UGC, user-generated content, and they were really worried because their publishing system was the lifeblood of their company, right? They're a content engine. If they were to have problems with users creating content, it would have a material impact on their, their company. And so what we did is we created a system that allowed them to uh, create and edit content both on the old site simultaneously with creating and editing content on the new site, and everything was served through the new site. And that gave us plenty of time to educate and train everybody on the new system. It actually happened much faster than anybody had anticipated, and the new tools were so great and solved so many of the problems that their users had in the old system that content production went up dramatically very quickly, leading to a, you know, an explosive growth for that organization in a really short period of time. Uh, last uh, is my favorite actually, was a global 500 company, uh, and they had a really unique situation where they had numerous CMSs across different groups and departments, and they wanted to consolidate all of them into one new Drupal site. Well, 
that is a huge endeavor, right? Just migrating any one of those sites, different versions of Drupal they had, Adobe Experience Manager, any one of those sites into Drupal would have been a challenging undertaking, and they wanted to get live quickly. So what we did is we put a decoupled front end over these CMSs. We had to do some work on these CMSs in the background to get them to talk more friendly with a decoupled interface, but in a very short period of time, months, they were able to launch a unified, cohesively unified, you know, end user experience across what used to be, you know, multiple different experiences on multiple different CMSs, quickly getting to where they wanted to be, and then over, I want to say it was like two years it took them to, you know, slowly in the background migrate off of these other systems. So, I'll hand it over to Mauricio. Thank you, Michael. Um, well, we're at DrupalCon, and if we're here, we want to migrate into Drupal. And it would be good if we take a step back and understand what are the different pieces that Drupal is built uh, upon, so that when we have the task of migrating to it, we can understand like the different pieces and how the different tools work together. So the very first one is configuration. Uh, earlier this week, there was a blog post from the Drupal Association that we want to improve our terminology because sometimes it is kind of confusing and cryptic. So I'm going to be doing some analogies, but for the sake of you know being technically correct, a configuration in Drupal determines the structure and of the site and how it functions. And you can think, oh, there you go. And you can think of it as a template for collecting uh, and presenting data. And this is where the beautiful images will come up. So you will have to picture them in your mind. Oh, there you go. Um, so think of this as like a bakery. You, are a bake you have a bakery and you have all these molds that you're going to use to make, you know, to pour in the, the, the butter. And once the, the different, you know, cupcakes are completed, you have the shelves or the, le uh, or the leads where you're going to display them. So the configuration of your website is the equivalent of these two. One is a container in which you are going to put information, and the other are like different uh, set of rules in which that information is going to be displayed. And again, going back to the technical, um, in Drupal, there are two types of configuration. One is called configuration entities, and in here you have content types, fields attached to those content types, taxonomy vocabularies, user roles and permissions, views. This is the one related to presenting information. And depending on the set of modules that you have, let's say that you are an e-commerce platform and you have, uh, you know, you are selling products, you, might, you will have commerce product types, and you will also, this is a very common path out of patterns for URL aliases that are easy to remember. So that, that pattern itself that is going to be follow every time that you create a new piece of content, that is configuration in Drupal. The second group of configuration is called just simple configuration, and your site name. That is something that Drupal stores uh, in a database and then you export to, to code files. The theme that the end users are going to see and the, in the back end the editors are going to interact with to enter content into the website, that is also configuration. And all the modules that you have, whether it is 10, 20, 100, like the state of being enabled or disabled, that is configuration. So I present a lot of sessions and trainings on this topic. And when we are time constrained, we don't have you know, the luxury to build a website from scratch and then teach how to migrate. So what I do is I prepare a repository where everything is set up, all the content types are set up, all the views are set up. Basically, you have an empty shelf in which you can start putting in content and we teach you how to migrate content in, into it. So think of configuration as, you know, this is how the site is going to work. Uh, just put your own content into it. And we have talked about content. So content is any user submitted data. And again, in the case of the analogy, the cupcakes is the content. But it is likely that you are not only showing one element uh, or one piece of data in, in your website. We can have cupcakes, we can have donuts, we can have bread. Similarly, in Drupal, there are different types of content. The most common one uh, is notes. And to be honest, it's probably the most confusing because it's one of the most generic words that you're going to, lead to hear in technology, but it is what it is. Uh, we have taxonomy terms for a categorization of content. We have files with an asterisk because we're going to talk about them in a moment. We have users. We have commerce products, again, if you have an e-commerce store. And there are many, many more. Um, I, I have an article in which I list uh, both configuration and content entities in Drupal core alone, excluding everything uh, in contributed 
uh, modules repository, and it is docents. So this is just like a high level overview. But one important thing about content is that they don't come in isolation. They, they are related to each other. And those relationships can be either explicit or implicit. An explicit relationship is, uh, for example, when you have a content type and you attach fields that relate to other entities. So let's say for the sake of the example that we are a news article uh, website and we are writing a, a new piece of content, a new article. So the article itself, the glue of everything else is the node. And then we have a feature image that is, an that is a relationship to another entity, a file. And then we have tags that are related to the content itself. Those are taxonomy terms. And even though you didn't attach a field to indicate who wrote the article, Drupal knows that implicitly. There is an implicit relationship that every node on, on the website is going to be created by someone on a specific date and a specific time. So that implicit relationship is to a user entity. So be mindful that all of this is, is connected. And in many cases, it's multiple layers deep. For example, you can have a node that is connected to a media entity that is connected to a file entity. So th that is just three levels in one very simple example. Uh, then we have files, which is technically content with the caveat that it has a, a, a physical file associated with it. Um, the, these files are usually assets that are uploaded through the Drupal interface and are managed by Drupal. And when I say manage, I mean access controls, uh, limits if you want to impose to how many times you can see or download a specific file, and so on. Uh, even though by default, the um, the files are going to be uploaded to the same server that uh, Drupal is being hosted on. You can also delegate the storage to a third party provider, for example, Amazon S3 or Backblaze V2 and so on. So a couple of examples of uh, files, images, text documents and spreadsheets, audio and video files. With this last two, it is actually recommended to host it in dedicated platforms like YouTube or Vimeo, and then refer to them using OMBED, uh, which is already supported in Drupal core. You don't need a specific, like extra tools to, to do this. So we have configuration, content, and files. What else? We have modules. Modules provide functionality to your website. Let's say that, you know, again, going back to the news article uh, example, when you create a new piece of content, you want a Facebook Facebook post to, you know, to appear automatically, and you want a tweet to be sent automatically, and you want to notify people via email if they subscribe to your website. So all of that is functionality. You can have, uh, as part of the, of the node, metadata that is associated with it and used uh, to automatically publish to all those different platforms. Most projects uh, will include a combination of Drupal core modules, contributed modules, and custom modules. And if you are coming from Drupal 7, uh, it is going to be mostly a manual process to, to upgrade to Drupal 10, the, the code itself, because the underlying API is very, very different. We went from uh, procedural code to object-oriented code. Uh, we are now adopting Symfony components. It's very, very different. Um, we also have themes. So themes control the appearance of the website, anywhere from fonts to colors to responsive behavior. Let's say that you are selling products and you are showing a grid of products. On a desktop computer, I want to show you know, four elements in one row. On a, a smaller screen, like a tablet, I'm going to show two. And if I am on, on my phone, only one element per row. So that is presentation. That is the presentation layer. So that is the responsibility of the theme. Um, it includes assets like CSS, JavaScript, uh, images, for example, for icons that are going to be displayed. And with very few exceptions, it is likely that you are going to have one single custom theme because you want to differen differentiate your organization from the rest of the world. Uh, it is possible to just like pick one from the contributed repository and change a little bit of the colors, but like the project that we usually work on is a, a dedicated custom theme for that organization. And again, coming from Drupal 7, um, even if you want to get like pixel perfect parity, it's a manual process because the theme engines are totally different. We used to write themes with PHP, now we use Tweak, it's a whole different story. And the last part of the puzzle is infrastructure. So you will need a database server and you will need a, a web server. It is highly recommended that you, that you uh, implement different caching, caching layers uh, for you know, performance and reliability, reliability of the website and maybe 
you need to implement search, and there are different uh, providers that can offer that to you. So when you are migrating, it is likely the case that the, it, the version of the different servers, uh, in technically speaking, they call the minimum version requirements are going to increase. So that can either force you just to bump to the next version, or in some cases to just like switch provider altogether because the one that you were using before is no longer supported. So at the very least, consider all of this. Now with that being said, we're going to talk about, oops, one moment. Um, audit, auditing your source site. Um, we're going to provide examples about Drupal 7 because that is the most common use case, but the few uh, slides that I'm going to share, they are applicable no matter where you come from. We have work on projects coming from WordPress, Adobe Experience Managers, or other proprietary CMSs, and this is basically the thought process that we go through. And for reference, uh, in that URL, you can find a spreadsheet with a template of things that you can consider when coming from Drupal 7 in particular. Okay, let's go. Uh, in order to understand some of these, I actually want to put them in the context of uh, a real life projects. So without disclosing names, um, this is a newspaper in Germany. And we're going to talk about site architecture. We, we already alluded to this, like you know, entities and relations among entities. So for this specific example, let's think about it this way. The newspaper has a separate portal for, se for selling uh, memberships, both like online memberships and for to get physical copies. So in this particular example, they had products, uh, and that product can be dig digital or physical, and they have uh, promotions that go along the products. And maybe if you sign up now, you get three months for free, or if you sign up now, you get an Apple Watch. Why not? So in just in this very simple example, we have two different entities and they are connected to offer something to the end user. And again, the end user by itself is another entity that is connected. We need to make content analysis. Um, what is change records? Change records refer to keeping track of every change that you, web, you make on the website. And in the context of this example, the change records were very uh, critical because if you offer a promotion and those have an expiring date, uh, you want to make sure that if at some point you change the promotion, you don't suddenly like overwrite everything that was offered already to a certain group of users. So the users that got the promotion on a specific date and time, they are going to see the, like a snapshot of, of what was available back then. And if you got it later, either better or worse, uh, or just disappeared, um, you know, you, you get to see like that is snapshot in time of what were the, the state of the different elements at, at that point in time. Now this German newspaper also serves uh, other countries, Austria and Switzerland to be specific. So if, um, in this case, they are not per se doing translations, they are mostly doing localization. In this context is um, if you are uh, in Switzerland, for example, the currency, the prices is no longer Euro, but, but instead Swiss francs. And even if, even though the three uh, countries speak German, they have variations in some words and phrases and structures. So they, they are not translating, but localizing the content to adapt to their specific audiences. And in the case of publication workflows, this is uh, twofold. For one, um, publication is mostly re responsibility of the marketing team but they need, they need to coordinate internally because as I said before, uh, the portal that sells the, the products is different from the main newspaper. So there, there must be some communication. And also, uh, just as an example, they schedule content in advance. So, okay, this is going to be published you know, in a week from now, and it is going to run the promotion for a two weeks window. And all of that, you know, it's baked in, into the system. And you know, in terms of access control, um, user accounts and tier of permissions. And in this case, it is also important to, again, like see it from two point of views. From one, if I am a consumer of the newspaper, I have an account because I subscribe and because of my subscription, I get access to this amount of content. But internally, th there are uh, th like the people creating the content and those people also have different set of permissions and access control. So all of that ties together into like, you know, Site architecture, content analysis, and access control. 
what else to consider? Um, again, we're going to, to switch, and this is going to be an example of um, basically a marketplace uh, in New York City. So they uh, offer assistance in, uh, for people to rent houses, and, but also they, for, for those who have the properties, and they help them manage them. Like we have a system for wait list, people get automatically added or removed, uh, or removed. they can filter uh, based on different criteria. Uh, they include very sensitive information like you know salaries and social security numbers and all of that. So with that in mind, um, the system is very complex and it does a lot of things like automatically under the hood. So we, you know, that, uh, that you know, you subscribe, you search for some criteria and you get automatically added. You get uh, scheduled to go see the property. If everything, you know, goes well and, and you want to proceed, uh, there are some legal requirements that need to be met. Like all of that process is, is automated. That is the business logic of your application. Uh, in this case, design and user experience is not only like how the website looks, it is also how it functions. How, uh, we are dealing with very sensitive information and with very real money implications, so it needs to be intuitive. Just taking a detour, uh, last week I read an article that in Iceland they have, uh, they are running, uh, they are having elections and they put up a form to basically endorse people to get elected and the UX of the form was so bad that people by mistake were, um, they were the ones like, like putting their names to be presidents without knowing because the form wasn't intuitive enough and people were just like signing up to be presidents and now they have something like 80 people running for presidents. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's in Drupal Slack in the UX channel, so if you want to read the article, it's there. But going back to the original example, again, like real big money implications. So you, the, the forms is not just like collect the data. They need to be intuitive. They, they need to be some checks. There are some cross checks, even with other system be, uh, outside of Drupal. So, and all of this, you know, it's tied to security, performance, and scalability. You need to, to consider that. And for third party integrations, again, I'm going to switch the example, and this is um, the, the government of Cambridge. They created a platform for um, finding like resources for, for kids and students, uh, like that can happen throughout the whole year. And in this platform, they basically want to centralize the content, all, all the different activities that, that, you know, that are offered in the city. So for one, they are importing content from other entities. One of those uh, is the local university. Once the content is centralized into the application, they are exposing it for others to consume um, in, in a structured way, like with, with specific formats for, so that you can consume the data and present it, like you know, open government, open data. That was basically the idea here. And finally, um, you can also expose an API, not only to read content from the website, but like to do the whole operation, like creating, deleting, updating. Um, we have seen a lot this lately with Drupal. Uh, you are going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, but at the same time, you are going into a decoupled architecture. So Drupal 10 becomes your uh, data storage for the most part, and then you have a front-end application that interacts via an API with, with the website. And this is also the case for mobile applications. So again, this applies no matter where you're coming from. And now we're going to talk about specifically if you're coming from Drupal 7. So the very first thing to look at is in your Drupal 7 side, check the modules that you are using and the themes that you are using. So a couple of things. Does your website currently use a distribution or custom installation profile? Uh, we work with a uh, there are so many examples. <laughs> we, we work with um, a scientific journal, and among other things, this website uh, organizes conferences. They happen you know, a couple of times a year. And in Drupal 7, they use a distribution called COD, Conference Organizing Distribution. And it was great because they got a lot of functionality basically for free. The problem is uh, that is no longer available for Drupal 10, so they need a way to migrate outside of that. And the other problem is that because they got so many things for free, they were just trying stuff, and it was so long ago that 
Nobody knows for certain what is being used, what is not being used. And point being, if you have a distribution in Drupal 7, it is likely that you have more things enabled than you actually need. And you need to take a step back and, and analyze like basically what, what we covered before. Uh, is this needed? Is this useful? Um, also, make a list of all the modules and themes that your site uses and take note if it is core or contrib or custom, are they enabled or disabled? And going to another example, uh, we have a project with, uh, in a, a, an Ivy League university, uh, one of the departments in, uh, in art, they had a website you know, for collecting uh, poems and images and it's, it's, it's a website that is not directly connected to the university, but is under their control. And when they gave us access, we were very surprised. They had literally hundreds of modules, and most, more than two-thirds of them were disabled, and we were asking why. And after some you know, digging around, we learned that because this website is under juridic jurisdiction of the university, it is the IT department, the one who set up the, the, the initial installation. And they had uh, a custom distribution that they use for every website in the university. So even though you only use like a third of the modules, you still got the whole package. So it was just like very confusing at the beginning, but once we understood the, the reason, okay, you know, this has to change, or at least improve a little bit. Because just for, for, for the record, Having a module disabled doesn't mean that you cannot be compromised if that module has a security vulnerability. So if you are not using it, it is better to remove it. Uh, another thing, uh, in terms of enabled projects, and this is the same example with the art, uh, art website for the university, they are migrating to Drupal 10. And are there versions available of that module in Drupal 10? And if so, what is the stability? Is the module stable or beta or alpha or just a development version? And in this context, the IT department is very strict and they only allow stable modules. So even though we can have like the same module available as a beta release, it was a no-go. Basically, it's like university policy. And on top of that, they had another policy that you can only use modules that are covered by the Drupal security team. So there were many restrictions in terms of what can be used or not. So sometimes it is not only about is it available or not. It, uh, you also need to consider the policies of your organization or if you, uh, you, know, you need to basically respect what the IT department is you know, suggesting. You know, the, another thing to consider. And in many cases, uh, modules are no longer available or there are better approaches to do it. Just to give a concrete example, in Drupal you are going to hear field collections, for example, in Drupal 7 are very common, and in Drupal 10 those were replaced by paragraph. So field collections exist, they are available, but the community now gravitates toward paragraph. So when you are going to make a migration, it is very likely that you're going to switch from one to the other. Uh, take note of how the modules are used. Again, going back to the same example of the art uh, website, they use rules, and rules is a huge module that allows you to do so many things. Among those things, they were using rules for sending emails. They were using rules for publishing and unpublishing content automatically, and other things. Rules is not stable in Drupal 10, so it was a no-go. So we had to take notes like detailed notes of how they were using rules so that we can re replicate that functionality in some other way, whether via other contributed modules or via custom code. And finally, make a re recommendation. Do we keep the module? Do we drop the module? Do we replace the module? And in some cases, uh, you know, Drupal evolves. A lot of things have made it into Drupal core. It will just work out of the box. Now we have um, content type audit. Again, uh, for every content type, list the machine name, the, uh, how many nodes exist per content type, and include a statistic about how many of them are published or not. Um, again, like we work with uh, the scientific journal example that I gave before. They had a lot of uh, content types, and many of them only had one or two or three nodes. You can basically consolidate those into a single one. 
Um, they also had a very curious example of a content type that was heavily used, but more than 90% of the content was unpublished. Upon revision, we realized that this is uh, a content type that was under uh, moderation control. So only the last step of the process means that the node was published. Everything else is unpublished or in draft state until like the, the complete workflow process is, is, is finished. So if you don't understand why that percentage was so high, you might just say, let's drop it. But in this case, it makes sense, and not only to migrate the content into the new site, but also to keep the different states so that when you are in the new platform, the publication workflow can continue as it was before. Uh, and again, for every uh, content type, indicate if the, if the content type itself needs to be migrated, and if so, do you need all the content? We have worked with many organizations that they say, we don't really need like 10 years of content, like we just like need information going forward. So we drop, we, we create the content type, but we drop the content itself. We don't migrate the content. Or they say, I only care about the last three years of content. Everything else is, is not needed. So again, I have those conversations between you know developers and stakeholders of, uh, so that you can understand and determine what is going to be migrated in the end. And for every content type, you know, does it use the field group module? Because you might want to automate that migration. Does it have revisions and translations enabled? Uh, is it presented as a standalone page or as a, a, a listing of pages within a view? Or is this embedded into another content type? In Drupal 7, it was very common that we would use nodes for many things. And in Drupal 8, with the evolution of entities, a lot of those things are no longer needed to be, uh, doesn't have to be notes anymore. So uh, in, in one of the courses that I teach, um, we, 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 we explain how to go from notes to users, from notes to paragraph, from files to media entities and so on. So think about what is going to be like the proper entity when you, when you move. And, for the sake of time, I'm going to be uh, quick with the other ones. Does the content type is provided by the installation profile or a specific module, a distribution? How uh, is the content managed, created, updated, deleted? Um, do, uh, as I said before, do you want to keep this content type as a content type or maybe change the entity type altogether? And for each of them, make a recommendation. And in the spreadsheet, you basically have a table in which you can fill out the data. Now with taxonomy vocabulary, it's going to be very similar. I want to highlight two things. Um, in the example that I gave about um, the like um, marketplace in New York City for houses, in the current Drupal 7 site, they had a lot of fields uh, of type list text, and they needed to change those to vocabularies and use taxonomy terms instead, because they were changing them so often that it was not uh, useful to make a deployment for, uh, you, know, you know, to, for the new options in the list field to appear in the live site. If you are using list fields, you need to make a deployment for, if you want to change the selection. If you use vocabularies, you just do it from the interface. So it was a matter of like being able to respond to client needs uh, faster. So, you know, again, like fr from, from list fields, we changed the entity altogether to vocabularies and then we adapted, adapted the migration so that, you know, what was the field list value in Drupal 7 now becomes uh, a taxonomy term reference. And similar to other analysis, is this vocabulary working in conjunction with other modules? For example, uh, taxonomy menu allows you to build a menu out of your taxonomy system. Uh, taxonomy access or TAC Lite allows you to provide access controls to certain parts of the website based on your taxonomy terms. So. Um, you know, consider if there is something else in addition to just that, that terms. And one last thing before I forget, uh, in Drupal uh, 10, it is now possible to attach field to taxonomy terms. So is there any field attachment that you need to carry over? Uh, with fields, again, in Drupal 7, there is a field list report. This is my second favorite page in the whole group of Drupal 7. And the first one is uh, the module extent page, but this is the second one. 
And basically, look at that page. It is going to give you a high-level overview of uh, all the fields, all the entities, and what modules are being used to provide those fields. So in one page, just take a screenshot, send it to me, and I can give you a summary. Like if, you know. And well, that being said, make a list of every field per entity, per bundle, include the field type, take note if it is a shared field. Something that is different between Drupal 7 and Drupal 10 is that in Drupal 7, you can have a shared field across multiple entities. In Drupal 10, that is no longer allowed. So again, if that was the case, you need to account for that. And if the fields are used in conjunction with other modules for visibility purposes, like conditional fields or the state API, for access control, like field permissions or TAC light, and determine if you want to keep the same field or you want to make any transformation. Um, in, the, in one of the courses that I teach, we combine fields, like multiple fields, we combine them into one. We break out fields, like from one going to multiple ones, or we change uh, the entity altogether, like what I was describing before, going from list text to vocabularies. And again, at, at the end, always make a recommendation of what needs to be done. With views, um, this is something that there is no, an easy way to automate the upgrade of views. There are some models that can help you, but for the most part, it will require some manual component. In, in here, you need to determine, do I want to make a high-level analysis or a very verbose analysis? The German project, they had about 10 views. So, you know, just a high-level overview is enough. The uh, marketplace in New York City, they had literally like 100 views. And it is not just listing content, there is functionality embedded into those. So we needed to be very careful that, uh, you know, as detailed as possible or verbose as possible. And in this case, we, we make an analysis on a view display uh, basis. Uh, for each view, indicate what is the base table, that is the entity that the view is responsible for showing, what is the machine name, and again, views is huge books, workshops, whole Drupal cons just on this topic and it is, cannot be covered. So for the sake of brevity, these are some modules that you can integrate with views and if you are using them in Drupal 7, make sure to account for those, for data export, for admin actions, for email delivery, for creating light boxes and on other backend functionality. And at the end, make a recommendation. What else to consider? Is there, is there more? Of course there is more. Web form, big module. Um, and this is interesting in many ways. We have seen organizations that they install web form and they forgot about it. And they have submissions and they forgot about it. And we just don't migrate those. In other cases, the web forms are used just for the contact form. And Drupal Core offers a module for that. Why do you want to add a big code base to your new site just for a contact form? So we use the core contact module. And in other cases, like they literally have hundreds of web forms with millions of submissions, and they need to be kept as is for regulatory reasons, we take the time to do that migration properly. As I said before, going from field collection to paragraph is a very common uh, need. Um, your menus, your files, in the case of files, think about are they public files or private files or, ex or external files? What type of files they are, audio, documents, video, images, Think about your roles and permissions. Think about text format, input filters, WYSIWYG profiles. This one is very important because it has security considerations. So be mindful and very careful about this one. Uh, image style and image effects. This one can have performance implications in the way that you load your images. And organic groups, rules. Again, this is going to be different depending on what set of modules you are using. And, and data migrations, the most complicated, expensive, time-consuming part of the migration, we're just going to give you a high-level overview. You can use the Migrate API, which is my favorite. Uh, it supports migrating configuration and content. It doesn't help at all with custom modules or themes, nor with the infrastructure. You can also use the Fits module. This mostly helps with migrating content. You can do a manual copy over. If you have a simple or small enough website, you can just like spend a couple of hours and do it over from scratch. And I haven't done this or tried this, but it is available. And if you want to, uh, there is a project called Retrofit that allows you to run Drupal 7 code in a Drupal 10 code base. And the maintainer is a very prolific Drupal contributor called Matt Glaman. So I know it's great quality code. 
I just haven't had the opportunity to try it. And um, just, again, I think about uh, what the Merit API can do for you in terms of automation. You can automate migrating configuration and content, or you can only migrate the configuration automatically. Uh, sorry, you can only migrate the content automatically after setting up the configuration yourself, or you do both. The one thing that I want to talk about here is that I have seen I have seen um, organizations that started the upgrade to Drupal 10 many years ago, and they had time, so they were able to think about you know the whole architecture. And in those cases, let's use the best that is available now. They create the configuration manually, and we only migrate the content over. Now with Drupal 7 and offly so close, organization are rushing, and they say, I just want I want to one copy. I just want to be on a supported version of Drupal. And I we have seen that they are trying to basically try to copy as much as possible, uh, both configuration and content, to be compliant, like to be on supported version. Some resources, uh, the book that I wrote on Drupal migration, the Migrate API in general, the current one that I'm writing from going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, the podcast series, the official documentation about migration and some DI yourself, uh, DIY resources that the DA put up. And with that, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Okay, um, so the question is about the links in the presentation. We're going to make sure that they work. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> letting us know about that. So, I have a quick question. Do, uh, you gave an example of a possible pathway of migrating to a site by having both run simultaneously and using data from the old site or being included in the old end and new. Um, so the question is, um, how can we serve a website that, like having Drupal 7 and Drupal 10 at the same time? So old site and new site both running at the same time, is that something that you yeah. talked about? And then referencing or the, the content contributor being able to edit the old site at the same time as being able to edit on the new site? Yeah. The data was replicated over from the old system into the new system, okay. and so that when, you know, on publish it was put to the new system and served out of the new system, on edit it was updated into the new system. If you created it in the old system and then edited it in the new system, you couldn't go back to the old system. Okay. You're talking about the sign up changes that you're talking about, are you? Mm -hmm. So it's an incremental migration using the Migrate API. Okay. Awesome. Oh, oh. Um, the question is about files uh, using the Merit API. So we have a podcast where we talk about this problem, but for, for a quick reference, you can manually put the files in the new server, and there is a flag in the file copy plugin that says use existing. So if the file is already found, it doesn't need to do the HTTP request. So basically, you download a tar file with how many gigabytes of files, putting in the new server in the right location, and when the Migrate API runs, it checks before downloading, does it exist? And if so, it just like, yes, writes, writes the record without having to download. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. But the podcast go into way more detail, so I highly recommend it.
Okay, so the question is how to plan when, like when to start the migration? Is that, did I get it right? Okay, so, so how to start planning the content modeling, the architecture, and eventually running the migration? So basically, the first thing that I do is fill out a template. That is going to answer so many questions, and it is also bring up a lot of questions that, that from a technical perspective, you can bring up to, to the like people using the website and try to understand why things happen in a specific way. So very first thing to do is spend two hours filling out that template, and that saved me hundreds of hours down the road. If I try, if I, if I, if I start implementing something, only to realize that it was not needed or it needed to be changed, it is better to have those conversations early on, and the template is a very good starting uh, point. Now, as to when to um, start the process of, of migration, it will highly depend on, on the scale of the project. Um, we usually work with very large projects, and it is impossible to say, let's build everything, and after everything is built, let's just start migrating everything. So usually we take like a, a, a phase approach, and it's like, you know, there is a team uh, building the features, and there is a separate team in, in charge of migrating into what has been built. And if it is like one content type at a time, and one entity type at a time, that is fine. The only caveat is that when you do it like that, uh, you need to have tests in place because it is possible that, you know, throughout the lifespan of the project, something changed, some requirement changed, and they went back to update a, an entity or a field. So you need to be able to catch, oh, I need to upgrade my migration script to account for that change. But it is usually like for big projects, it is like that. Um, there is a team building the new features, and there is a separate team migrating into what has been so f into what has been built so far. So you parallel. Yeah, yeah, nice. yep. Yeah. And just for the record uh, and an example, there was a project that was like nine months old, and w at some point, like we had the source site, we have a group. It, back then, it was Drupal nine coming from Drupal six, so we have content in Drupal 6 that needed to be migrated. We enable a staging site for the, for the client to get familiarized with the new editorial exp experience in Drupal 9. And in addition to that, the client wanted to uh, uh, import content from spreadsheets. So the final migration, like when we, when we did the final cutoff, we were pulling from three data sources, Drupal 6, the staging Drupal 9 site, and the spreadsheet to migrate uh, the translations. And you know, again, like you need to plan for it, but as long as you take the the proper measures, uh, it, it worked really well. Yeah, you're welcome. There's another talk coming in. Yeah, we need to wrap up. Thank you very much.